Hello, welcome and thank you for joining the Middle School Matters webinar entitled Early Warning System, What Research and Practice Does About Indicators and Interventions. My name is Christy Murray and I'm the Project Director for the Middle School Matters Institute. I'll be moderating today's call. Our presentation today focuses on the use of early warning systems in middle grade schools. Information on early warning systems can be found throughout our Middle School Matters field guide, including within the content dimensions of school climate, performance management, and dropout prevention. If you wish to learn more, the Middle School Matters field guide is available for download from our website, which is www.middleschoolinstitute.org. Our presenter this afternoon is Dr. Robert Balfons from Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Balfons is a research scientist at the Center for Social Organization of Schools at Johns Hopkins University and associate director of the Talent Development Middle and High School Project. Balfons has published widely on secondary school reform, high school dropouts, and instructional interventions in high poverty schools. His research background includes developing, implementing, and evaluating comprehensive whole school reforms and translating research findings into effective reforms for high poverty secondary schools. And now I'll turn things over to Dr. Balfon. Uh, thank you. And it's a pleasure being here with everyone this afternoon. Um, I'm sure after a good day of hard work. What we're going to do is we're going to spend a little time, very few slides, just on the general overview and context of why early warning systems are important. Then we're going to spend some time talking about indicators. How do you have good indicators and, and how do you use them? And after that, we'll have a time for some questions and answers. And then we'll spend the second part of the session on really once we know which kids need help, how do we help them? What do we know about good interventions? So to begin, you know, the first key part of context, we know that there's really two key drivers of student success that schools can have direct influence over. The first is the quality of the course of what we're asking our students cognitively. But the second is the quality of relationships with the adults in the school. And it's actually the quality of these relationships which propel students to attend, behave, and try. In an era when all students need to graduate, prepare for college and career, however, we know that just simply having great teachers and a great curriculum is not enough. We also need students to come to school to focus and complete their assignments. Poverty complicates this, and the challenges are significant. Because in the past, right, if some kids didn't quite succeed in school, there, was, there were other alternatives for them. They could find a factory job or other avenues that would lead still to a good middle class life. Those don't exist anymore, so all our students have got to move through the middle grade into high school, and in high school be prepared for college and career. So that means to do that, they've got to sort of be there, be focused, and do their part, and then also have great teachers and great curriculum along the way. So a key point we're going to talk about is that schools can and need to be organized, not only to provide a good lesson and a good teacher every day, but also to make sure that students attend, behave, and try. Throughout this, the middle grades are really the key pivot point in, these, in our students' uh, pathway to adult success. It's really in the middle grades where students are really put on one of three paths. One path is the path to dropping out. Another path is the path to just getting by high school graduation, but not really being ready for anything past that. And the third path is being on path to high school graduation, ready for college and career. And the middle grades are also, we know, when kids make an independent decision, is schooling for me? Is this really beneficial? Is it worthwhile? Is it going to change my life? Should I invest in it? Or is it something simply to endure and get through as quickly as I can with as little effort as possible? Early warning systems keep students on the path to high school graduation and improve school outcomes because they signal when students are just beginning to fall off the path to high school graduation. They help us get the right intervention to the right student at the right time. They enable schools to maximize the impact of their critical resources. Time, people, and funding are all scarce in schools, and we really want to use them where they can have the most strategic impact. It shows, it shows us which students need stronger adult relationships, back to that key point before. Who do we have to build a stronger bond with? to make them sort of come, behave, try, and, and get their work done. And also, it enables adults to pull, pool their knowledge, talents, and time to change student behavior and solve problems. Because not all everyone in the school has the same talents or the same insights into students. And we really can't have teachers trying to do this by themselves. We have to develop systems to let them pool their knowledge and pool their strengths. 
So the core idea of early warning systems is that to graduate college and career ready, students need to successfully navigate several key transitions and acquire a set of academic behaviors. In short, they need to learn how to succeed at school. Students signal that they are on or off track towards these outcomes through their attendance, behavior, and course performance, which ironically become the ABCs of being on track to graduation. By tracking the ABCs, it's possible to identify when students are beginning to fall off track and providing time to intervene and alter their trajectory through school and beyond. Using ABCs early indicator data, it's also possible to design more targeted and effective interventions, not only at the individual level, but also at the classroom, school, and even district and state levels. So good early warning systems combine accurate and useful indicators with effective interventions. And we're going to start now thinking and talking about what we know from research and practice about what make good indicators. So good indicators really have three characteristics. First, they're reliable and valid, which means they flag students who absent effective intervention will not have a good result. Right? We don't want to be flagging students that will self-correct, that just had a bad day, that were sick for, because they had the flu. That's not kids we need to really mobilize around. That will self-correct or take care of itself. So we want indicators that say, if we don't do something for this student, they're signaling that a good result will not happen. We want our indicators to be practically useful. They need to really identify a significant portion of students who, ab absent effective intervention, have high odds of dropping out or not succeeding. Right? We can develop a set of indicators that are extremely predictive, but they would only identify 1 or 2% of students. So for those two few students, they'd be good, but they really wouldn't provide a transformative effect for the school. And finally, we want our indicators to be parsimonious. We don't really want to have 20 or 25 indicators. That's really too much to keep track of and interpret. We really want to have two or three or four or five. We want to make sure that each indicator adds additional information that's actionable that's not provided by another indicator. When we did this, and we sort of looked at 30, 40, 50 variables to begin with and followed whole cohorts of students from sixth grade forward to two years past graduation in multiple cities and states, as we mentioned before, we really saw three indicators that popped out, which is that students that are not attending less than 9, 10, that are missing 10% of school or more, essentially a month or more of school, students that are getting sort of sustained mild misbehavior, whether shown by behavior marks or office referrals, and or students that are getting two or more suspensions, and students that are getting an F in math and English as early as sixth grade, absent intervention in high poverty environments, only about one in five or so of those students ultimately graduate. And that's quite shocking. These are 11 and 12 year olds, and if we don't mobilize to get them back on track and intervene successfully, they're going to have very you know, bad outcomes. And a key thing to keep in mind here about course performance, which we'll come back to, is that it's pretty hard to actually get an F in sixth grade. And that's why it's a pretty strong signal. There are three types of indicators. We've been talking about off-track indicators in the ABCs in the slide before, which says action needs to be taken. If we don't act, a bad result is going to occur. There's another group of indicators that are sort of like tending, trending, moving towards that, but are not quite there. And they really say perhaps we should just, you know, closely monitor this situation. We may not need to intervene yet. It may self-correct, but we should keep a close eye on it. So this is something that might be trending down in an indicator, but it hasn't hit the threshold yet. Maybe somebody with multiple latenesses, um, or has maybe that initial behavioral incident. And then we have to remember, we also want to use positive indicators, which really tells us that students with these outcomes have high odds of a good result. We're really trying to drive down the off-track indicators and drive up the positive indicators. Here are a few key findings we found about each of these ABC indicators. So for attendance, we know students who are missed 10% or more of school need intervention. It's hard to make an argument how you can miss a month of school, 20 days, and have that be a good or a not, not a negative result, right? That's a lot of school. And if kids are missing that much, we really need to intervene and really try to prevent them from getting there. And if they have, if they have gotten there, make sure it doesn't happen again. But we also know it's the students who miss five or fewer days who really thrive. So that tells us we want to pay some attention to students that are missing more than five days, but less than 10%. These might be our check-in and monitor students, and also our really strong prevention students, that if they're trending towards that 10%, we want to intervene before they get there. 
For behavior, what we've learned over time is that students with sustained mild misbehavior fall off track in large numbers. So therefore, it's important to track minor as well as major incidents. So these are continual office referrals or poor behavior grades where they're given, things that don't rise to the level of a suspension. But if they're happening consistently, we find that they're as, as predictive as suspension. And many more kids demonstrate in the middle grades the same mild misbehavior than demonstrate things they get suspended for. We also know that if a student's suspended once, we really need to intervene so it doesn't happen again. Because students who get inter suspended two or more times, again, typically have relatively weak long-term outcomes. Course performance. It's really important to understand that for students' long-term success, the grades they get are as important as their test scores. Students with multiple Ds and Fs seldom graduate. Students with a B or better average typically succeed in college. And the way to think about this is that I often tell people it's sort of like what they've learned with political polls. That if you just have one poll, you can get wildly different results from one to the next. But if you average three or four or five or six polls together, you often get a pretty accurate predictor. And essentially, that's what you're doing when you're trying to, say, get like a B average or better or a D average or less. You are essentially taking snapshots of the student's performance and their teacher's views of their effort and their attendance and their behavior across multiple classrooms. And if that is consistently averaging low or high, it becomes a very strong indicator that absent intervention, this isn't going to self-correct. And we know from very recent research that was just released last week um, at the at a event we had at the Bush Institute is that students in the middle grades who have strong grades also typically do much better in high school and who have low grades typically keep having them in high school. A key thing when you're beginning with indicators is to keep is to start simple, is to really focus first on these ABCs and attendance behavior course performance. Here's a very sort of low-tech example of an early warning indicator data tool. It has students' number of days they miss. It's sort of a cumulative thing. This is a data that's roughly through three quarters through the year. These are the first three students on a teacher's eighth grade role. And it shows their, how many days they missed last year versus how many days they missed this year. It shows you they're in this district they still give behavior comments. The more comments you get, the worse you are. <laughs> um, so this shows you their comments in December and March. It shows you their grades. And over here, we show their most recent assessment. And as you can see, it's really this holistic look that really gives you a much better indicator where the student is. So if we look at student A, and we just looked at their test scores, we would say, wow, they're reading at grade level, and they're proficient in math. This, this kid's doing well. Like, there's a good kid heading your way, high school. But then we look over here, and we see they're getting Ds in math and literacy. They're getting mildly misbehaving. And their attendance, which was really good last year, is crashing this year. So this is a kid who something's happened in their life. And if we don't figure it out, what's going on, they're very likely to go and struggle right away in high school, even though they seem to have good test scores. The next student we see has, is sort of has lowish test scores that are below basic, below grade level. They're getting Ds and Fs, high in behavior comments almost you know, borderline on attendance. And the key factor here is, is which way is this going? Are these kids acting out and not paying attention in class because they don't understand the material because they're behind? Or is it they're not paying attention <laughs> and acting out and therefore not learning the material? And until we understand which way is that going, we could get the wrong intervention. If we think it's a skill gap and it's not and we give them tutoring, they may well get insulted and think, you've just called me stupid. And I'm not stupid. I'm just not trying for some other reason. We look at this last student. We can see they're below basic in everything. They're failing everything. They're off the charts in behavior. And their attendance, which was poor the year before, has crashed to 43%. This student, in fact, has missed 69 days of middle eighth grade. This is a student sort of DEFCOM 5, right? If we don't have intensive intervention, they probably won't even show up in high school. There'll be this, this unanalyzed group of kids that drop out after the middle grade. Because in our current accountability system, it's based on how many first-time freshmen graduate. But if you never show up in high school, you're not even counted in the sort of graduation statistics. We can clearly see a student like this might very well decide not even to show up in high school. 
once you can begin with the basics, you sort of get a handle on it, and you've sort of learned how to use the data and create systems behind it and have teams of teachers looking at it, and you, you're being able to react to it. Many schools that have used this for a couple of years begin adding more layers of detail and more layers of information to help get even more informed and more rapid interventions. So here's an example of adding in. This is two sixth grade students, a male and a female. Again, on the, the left side, we see our basic attendance. It's now color coded, so the, the female has missed 10 days. And this is quarter one data. It's missed 10 days of the first quarter, so that's more than 20%. So they're flagging red in attendance. We then see suspensions. The male student has already picked up one suspension, so they're in that yellow zone. We see their first quarter grades. And over here, we've added another layer of detail, which came from a survey the students took, basically a resiliency survey which sort of gave us a sense of their sense of motivation, their well-being, their stress levels, their connection, how connected they feel to others, their confidence, and their educational aspirations. And you can see here with our first student who is having attendance struggles, but is not is behaving, and has you know, got C's and B's. So maybe at this point, we're not really act being too intervening on the grades because they're, they're holding in there. We also notice that she's highly motivated. She's confident. She has high aspirations. But look at this. She has a low sense of well-being, a high sense of stress, and a lack of connection. So likely something very bad is happening outside of school, and the student feels isolated. And if we didn't have this additional sort of behavioral survey data, it might take us a while to pick it up from our first tier indicators. The next student we see is coming every day, but as we said, has already gotten in trouble. It's mainly got Bs and Cs, but it's failing science. We see over here that they are motivated. They feel well. They're not stressed. They got connections or confidence. This is probably a happy kid. He's probably a class cut up. But look at this. He has very low educational aspirations. For some reason, he doesn't have any connection that what's happening in sixth grade really has much impact on his future, or he doesn't have high hopes for his future. So that little piece of information there could really help us figure out what's going on over here with a little bit of acting out and, and this course failure. It's very key when we do this to understand that there's a huge tendency to focus on individual interventions. And in many ways, those first two cases show us how with good data we can get more fine-tuned individual interventions. But we have to remember that, especially high-need schools, there are lots of kids that are going to be showing up. And if we try to individually intervention our way out of it, there's going to be too many kids and not enough adults. So we also have to use the data to look for classroom grade, school, and district level interventions and ask, what is the most strategic point to intervene? So again, and this we get a little bit of shifting here with the slides, so I'll have to talk it through. This is, again, just as half of, of a sixth grade teacher's classroom at the end of quarter one. We can see a fair amount of red and yellow on the board already, which could almost feel overwhelming. But if we look at course failure, we can see that most of the failures are happening in science. So we really would want to investigate what is happening in science to have a large number of failures. And that may well need to be a classroom level intervention, not giving each of these students a tutor, which potentially could be sort of subsidizing ineffective instruction. We also see over here that we have a number of students trending low on educational aspirations. And again, that could be a group solution, some sort of goal setting exercise, some sort of relatively simple thing to help students recognize that what's happening in sixth grade impacts their future, and also that they should set high educational aspirations. Indicators are great. They have a lot of power. They can really tell us who to target. They can give us early warnings that we need to, to do something or a bad result is coming. But if we don't have a way to intervene, we haven't really gained much by having these indicators. So we're going to really spend some good time now digging into what do we know about intervention systems. The really big idea to get our heads around is that once a student has an off-track indicator, they've actually missed 20 days of school or they're on track to it. They've actually failed English or math for a quarter and you know moving to a semester. They're getting sent to the office a lot or suspended a lot. That we either have to change their behavior or solve a problem at this point, right? It's not going to self-correct. It's not as simple as saying, hey, get your act together, right? Because the kids are signaling over a number of times that there's something significant going on. 
So it's really going to be most cases be more than like, hey, you know, let's look at this. It's not good. Let's let's have a change here. That will work for some kids, but it's not going to work for most that already have an off-track indicator. Really, at this point, it's going to require an effective relationship between an adult and the student because we're either going to have to change their behavior or solve a problem. And as we know with our own kids or with adults, that you really can't change behavior or solve a problem if you don't have a relationship, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is a challenge to do when we have a large number of students that signal with off-track indicators. So again, this gets back to the point that a good intervention system has strong prevention elements, which reduces the number of students who develop off-track indicators. Back to this key idea that if we're in a school and we know that we've had a history of kids having a high number or a decent number of this or a large school, so even a small subset of kids adds up to lots of kids, um, that we really have to think about how we prevent some of this stuff because we can't individually intervene our way out of it because there's simply too many kids and not enough adults to form those core relationships to change behaviors or solve problems. So what we're trying to do at the heart of this is combine ready access at the classroom level. Teachers want to know about their kids right, um, to this data with regular time, as we talked about it, to analyze the data and organize a response that can act upon it in both systematic and tailored ways. One of the first key questions we have to ask, and you want to ask yourself, is who needs to be involved in this system at my school level? And again, there's no hard and fast answer to this. People have organized different large numbers of adults in different ways. But what we've learned over time is that it really comes down to how many students have off-track indicators or would, would likely have them. If it's less than 20 in the whole school, then an individual counselor or a social worker or a graduation coach or an assistant principal can sort of lead that effort. They're not doing it all by themselves. They're not dealing with just the 20 kids alone. But they're sort of leading the effort. They're monitoring the data. And they're organizing other adults to help with those kids as appropriate. If the number is somewhere between 20 and 50, and again, these are not hard and fast. You can you know, add plus or minus 5 or 10 to each, each way, then a small dedicated team can be enough, a student support team, which many schools have. Again, a small group of adults managing it, not solving every kid alone, organizing other adults or other supports as needed, but they're sort of the, the organizing unit. In our experience, if there's more than 50 kids, though, with off-track indicators, we really have to get the teachers involved. Because at the end of the day, kids come to school, behave, and try for their teacher, first and foremost. And this idea of teacher teams, <coughs> we're going to get back to, is we need to organize teams of teachers looking at this data, sharing their solutions, sharing their knowledge of kids, if we have 50 or more kids signaling at our school level. Because at that point, we need to have more adults involved to deal with the magnitude of the number of kids. And, and however we decide to do it, we really can't underestimate mission building, professional development, coaching, and networking. This is a new idea. I mean, it seems simple. It seems straightforward. And schools have had student support teams and, and social workers, sure. But that, this idea of tracking all kids on these early warning indicators and intervening quickly when kids are trending off track is, 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 an, is a way that hasn't happened in a lot of schools. So any new idea, we need to spend time building mission, making sure people understand what they're supposed to do and how to do it, having some coaching, some solving, and trying to network with, with other folks, as you guys are all doing through the Middle Grades Matters Network with other folks that have done it so that you're not, you can learn from other people and it doesn't feel like you're trying to do it alone. So at the most basic idea, what we're doing is you're going to basically compose a support list of students based on this data. And you're going to revise it regularly by looking at that data every two weeks or every month at least. And you're basically then trying to act on the data in that, in that support list. And you want to make decisions about the actions and interventions by pooling multiple adult knowledge. Because again, kids tell different parts of the story to different adults in the school. And you really need to pool that knowledge and say, hey, in, in my class, this kid is focused and doing well. In my class, he's not. What might be going on there? Or it may be that the kid trusts one teacher more and, and reveals more things, like saying, hey, I'm, I'm actually, you know, I often miss school because I have to give daycare to my sister, right? Because there's no one else. And my mom or dad has to work, and we can't find it, and they ask me to stay home. Right? That's, that's not going to be told to all teachers, but maybe to one teacher. And if we don't create a venue for teachers to share that knowledge about their students, they don't really have the opportunity to tell the other teachers, hey, let's, let me tell you what's really going on here. Um, use your knowledge of your school and your students when choosing interventions. There's not like one size fits all. 
And also here, be careful of sort of the tendency we all have as humans to develop a default strategy. Well, if a kid's absent, the first thing we always do is this. Test that out to make sure that, that whatever that this is is actually effective. And is it effective for all kids or just a subset of kids? Build on student strengths, right? We want to avoid this of being sort of a deficit thing. Uh-oh, you're signaling. You're off track. We have to do something. Well, yes, we do. But let's find some strengths to build on. And that, if you go back to that survey we saw, right, kids that maybe are feeling stressed might still have confidence. Things like that. OK, they have confidence. Let's use that to deal with some of these other issues they're facing. It's really important, once we've decided to have intervention, to assign an adult champion who has a relationship with that student, back to that idea that to change behavior and solve a problem, we've got to have a relationship, to make sure the intervention occurs, right? Folks are busy. A lot's going on. We really need someone to be the champion to say, hey, as a group, we decided we need to do x. Let me make sure x really happens with this student, and that they really and it's making a difference. And as I say, we really got to discipline ourselves to track interventions on a regular basis. Again, we're trying to do many things at once. We have more to do in a day that could be done in a day. And we often think the main thing to do is to figure out the intervention and intervene. But if we're not tracking the intervention, if we're not really taking that extra 30 seconds or a minute to write down what we decided to do so we can come back two weeks later, four weeks later, six weeks later, and say, hey, for all the kids we tried that on, how many did that intervention succeed? Because by building up that knowledge base of which kids it work for when is when you really develop your local knowledge of what works for your kids. And that won't happen unless you really put in that extra time, as challenging as it often is, to document and track and then analyze the interventions and see if they actually work. The, the, that's, again, we, you know, keep it simple to start. That's the most simple, straightforward ap approach once you've got that under your belt. This goes to the next level. There's a next level to take it to. And that's really starting to build sort of a tiered intervention model, which is sort of your, your upfront preventions that prevent kids from being off track, and sort of small group targeted interventions for the next level of kids, and then saving your high intensity case managed one on one for, for the kids the other interventions aren't working, that nothing else but that works. So here it's important to have some diagnostic tools to let you figure out, is this behavior driven by academic? or social-emotional needs, or both. And remember, that gets us back to that student we saw that was both getting in trouble and failing their classes and had a low academic, and really trying to get a sense, is, is that because they are not paying attention, they don't believe school is from them, something's going on, and therefore they're not doing well, or because they're so far behind academically, they can't understand what's going on, and they're getting frustrated and acting out. And really deducing which way that's flowing it's really fundamental to getting the right intervention. Because if you, if you go the wrong way, you could actually make it worse. Um, as we said, look for, act upon patterns that emerge from the data. So it's not just individual, but it's also classroom, school, and in some cases, district. Do this school-wide prevention, and then the tiers we talked about. And then ultimately, this additional data we saw can help tailor interventions. So are most kids that are failing over age? So that'll tell us something about that interaction? Or are they English language learners? Or is it really that most of the kids are failing or actually just coming from one or two classrooms? Which again might tell us it's more of a classroom issue than sort of a school-wide student issue. So two key questions to ask ourselves are, based on this data, where is the most effective and strategic place to intervene? And next one, which we're going to come to, is does the school have the scale and scope of interventions needed to reach all its students? And a really good tool to use for this um, is just a very simple grid that asks ourselves two levels of questions. It says, what are we doing for attendance, prevention, behavior, and course performance at the whole school level? What do we have at the targeted level? What do we have at the intensive level? And when most schools fill this out at just that level, they can usually fill this grid in, except for maybe one box. Go to their school improvement plan, or just sit around, what are we doing? And it seems like, hey, we got this covered. It's when you ask the next set of questions that oftentimes unanticipated holes in your sort of current <laughs> offensive and defensive strategy, if you will, come to bear, which is that um, what is the need? How many kids actually need this intervention? So for example, if we have a great literacy lab that helps kids that come in behind when they're behind in reading, it's effective. It does a dynamic job. It's a great teacher. It can serve 20 kids. 
if our data says 60 kids need that intervention, then what we're doing is, is good. It makes a difference. But we actually don't have a targeted intervention for all kids that need it. And then finally, do we have any evidence of the effectiveness of what we're doing? Or again, is it sort of our default strategy? It's what we've sort of done. And because we haven't disaggregated what's happening, you know, basically if things are improved by the end of the year, we sort of feel like everything we're doing is working. <laughs> if things aren't improving, we're then saying, hmm, not much is working. We have to throw it out. The truth is, is probably when you get that sense that we had general improvement, that maybe six out of four things, six out of ten things worked. And when we had, we didn't get that gains we wanted, maybe it's like three out of ten things are working. But it's never quite this all or nothing, which we tend to go to if we're not doing closer tracking and asking ourselves, are these individual components as effective as they can be? Some good practice ideas for building this intervention system. You need to practice intervention discipline. So oftentimes when we're getting together, and it's a very powerful thing, we actually have a group of adults that could be as high as sometimes 10 adults talking about one kid. And our hearts go out to this kid, and we want to have a big impact first. And we sort of go right immediately to the highest intensity intervention we have. And the truth is we don't have enough high intensity interventions to reach all the kids we might want to give them to. So we have to have that intervention discipline to say, well, we first try to target intervention. Is that going to be sufficient before we go to this case-managed high-intensity intervention or not? As we talked about, we have to track our intervention. We need to cast a wide net to get enough adults involved to deal with the magnitude. So that's parents, that's nonprofits, that's community organizations. Often an untapped resource that's sort of different than you may have imagined in the past is you're going to be your local United Way. In the past, United Ways were sort of did 100 good works for the community. They're now trying to focus their efforts on three major tasks, one of which is cutting the number of dropouts in half by 2018, and really trying to organize a lot of their volunteer work and mentoring work around some of these ABC indicators. So it's a good time to recheck in with the United. Not all United Ways are there yet, but that's an example of a community organization that you may not be aware of is actually trying to mobilize against these things and could be a good source of sort of additional person power especially when there's a high number of students that sort of have these indicators. In other cases, if you're near a university or a college, there's often ways to get college students for community service involved. There's National Service AmeriCorps programs available in some places. You just need to think, where can I get sort of this second shift of adults um, that can help us with sort of this, what we often call the nagging and nurturing, which is you know, to be able to say, you know, Sarah, I'm so excited you're in school today. And I expect you'll be, you'll, um, I'll hear that you're here tomorrow. And if not, I'll, I'll come check it out. And, you know, did you get your homework done? All right, let's make sure we, we double check that after school or give me a call or text me to make sure that happens. And you know, I sort of hear you're having trouble with one of your teachers. Let's talk about that a little bit because I'm, you know, I'm sure there's two sides to that story and we really got to get you together. It doesn't take a lot, but there's often a large number of kids that need that on a continual basis. And if it's a high number, there's just not enough teachers to do it alone. You really need to think about how can I organize this second shift of support. We're going to take a few minutes here before we get to some more questions to go, again, some key learnings we've had from early adopters on intervening against each of our AVC indicators, attendance, behavior, and course performance. So for attendance, we really have to organize comprehensive efforts built around the knowledge that from the middle grades onward, absenteeism is really driven by one of three different factors, each of which needs a different solution. So for some students, they just get, maybe they can only go, if they go four out of five days a week, it's enough. They'll get by. And they're just sort of making the choice, sort of discretionary choice, not to come to school on a regular basis. And they sort of know that they won't be noticed, that they can, you know, get, go and get on the school bus and their parents see them. But when they, you know, somehow find a way, they can quickly turn left and not right when they get to the school and they won't be noticed, right? Or they've figured out a way that they can miss a few days and they don't see a big reaction. There's another group of students that it's, it's something in school they're trying to avoid. They're being bullied. They're being teased. They don't feel safe in school or going to school. In some cases, kids are reported their, you know, people, teachers are asking them to read out loud in class. And they, they don't read well or they don't speak well. And that alone is enough to sort of keep them out of school. So there are these kids that are sort of being pushed away because they're trying to avoid things. And then finally, there's going to be a set of kids that it's out of school factors pulling them away, as we said, being 
when they be, reach 12 and 13 and 14, young girls especially often become emergency daycare mm -hmm. in many situations for younger siblings. So um, there's also growing examples of elder care, living in you know a single parent but multi generational household, and a grandparent or an uncle or an aunt help care for them. Now that aunt is uncle or great aunt is elderly and needs support, and often the young adolescents start playing a role in that. So that we have to understand, or sometimes they try to work on the side to pay the electric bill. There's all sorts of reasons that when they reach early adolescence, that something outside of school can be pulling kids away. And if we don't get the diagnosis right, you can see that for each one of these, you need very different interventions. We have to also create pro programming that compels students to come to school. We don't often like to recognize this, and we feel that students should just come because it's good for them, and what we're doing must be good. But if we're honest, you know, some of the most engaged students we find in middle grades are doing often what we call cognitively rich activities, which combine teamwork with performance. It really hits them in their developmental sweet spot, their desire for sort of camaraderie and adventure when they're in early adolescence. So often you'll find that it's the kids in robotics, debate, drama, chess, sports, all things, that that's where they're really highly engaged. And we really have to make sure that kids have an opportunity to do that as sort of this pull and this draw so they will feel successful. This is especially important for kids that are struggling academically. Because if you, you're struggling academically and you have behind grade level skills, it's a long slog until you start turning that around. And you know for adults, right, instant gratification is still pretty high even as an adult, let alone as a early adolescent when it's running really high. And so these cognitively rich activities that combine teamwork or performance often have short cycles. We put on the you know, effort to, to reward. We put on a play, it rehearses for six, eight weeks. If we don't try, we have a bad performance. If I don't put effort into my robotics, it gets munched in the first round. If I don't prepare for my debate, I do lousy next week. So these things have sort of this rap more rapid cycle of effort to uh, recognition along with the teamwork thing. So those are often strong draws. They're often, unfortunately, the first thing we cut when we have budget crises or, or things. But we have to remember these are often important draws for these students. And as he said, we have to build an attendance problem-solving capacity. It often mm -hmm. involves building relationships with wraparound service providers and other folks to help provide these supports. Because again, some of these problems behind chronic absenteeism are really astounding when you start unrolling the onion and seeing what's behind them. And they often are far beyond the school alone to solve. That's why you have to build this network of, 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 of supporters and, and problem solvers that are sort of have capacities outside the school. Whatever. For behavior and effort, we really have to think about modeling and teaching these resiliency, self-management, and organization skills. In the past, kids that had these and often learned them outside of school were the kids that went on to college and succeeded. And that was OK if there was other avenues to adult success besides college. Now that we know that almost everybody needs some sort of post-secondary schooling or training, or the military, we have to think more about seriously teaching these resiliency, self-management, organizational skills as part of the curriculum because they're really central to be kids being able to get their work done, get good grades, manage multiple classes. We have probably may have to implement school-wide positive behavior support programs and alternative suspensions. We may have to relook at our disciplinary policies. Do they still make sense? Are they really achieving the goals we want to achieve of keeping all our kids on track to adult success? Two big ideas to end with here. We have to really work to ensure that students experience consistent academic and behavioral norms as they travel from class to class. That's a typo there. It should be class, um, not call. Um, for kids, school is the collection of classrooms they visit in a day. It's not the whole building. It's not a general feeling. It is the experience they have in each of those classrooms added together. If they, if they go during the day and they have wildly different academic and behavioral expectations, classrooms to classrooms, this is sort of a loose, happy-go-lucky classroom where you know people can start a little bit late and no one says anything. This is a very strict classroom. You do one little thing out of line and you're in the office. This is a classroom that has a strong academic press. This one, not quite so much. What kids learn from that is they make everything personalized. This is a good teacher, a bad teacher, a hard teacher, an easy teacher. And then we get in this huge battle of respect, which just sort of spirals downward. What we really want to achieve is that we want kids to have a sense that school is just like this. As I go from classroom to classroom, I more or less have the same academic and behavioral norm. That's just what school is. It's not teacher to teacher. And that makes, creates this whole environment of that's just the way we do it. 
and I'm not personalizing everything I do from period to period. The other key thing we have to think about is we really have to think about building these success scripts in students' heads, especially students that experienced failure before. Um, and undermine the failure script they probably have in their head, which is we really yeah. want to create these opportunities to show that effort leads to success. Because actual, when you live in a high poverty environment, your lived experience is not that. Your lived experience is that life is capricious. Your parents may be working really hard. They may have two, three jobs, and you may still lose your house, right? So what happens in those cases is that you learn that withholding effort keeps you psychologically safe. So what you learn is, is that, and you'll see this with kids. You'll say, come to tutor and come and say, oh, I don't need it. I know I did bad that test, but I didn't care. As soon as I, when I do care, when I need to, I can turn it on, and I'll do fine. Uh, no thank you for your tutoring. What they're actually doing there is keeping themselves psychologically safe, but academically and future at risk. Because what they're saying is the riskiest thing for them is to say, I tried really, really hard, and I still failed. So to avoid that, they sort of say, ah, I, I withheld my effort, and I can turn my effort on when I need to. Now, we know, in fact, that's not the case, but that's the story they tell themselves. And that's essentially a failure script. So we really have to think about building success scripts and minimizing these failure scripts. Course performance. We need to provide, for many kids that are failing their classes or coming close, actual coaching, assistance, support, even advocacy, which enables them to succeed in their courses. That means someone, not always the teacher, sometimes the second shift, sometimes other adults in the building, has got to monitor assignment completion and preparation for tests and quizzes and help them catch up when they're absent. We have to really make sure our tutoring efforts are tightly linked with the needs and ex expectations of the students' courses. So we don't want to have a situation where we've got this really good after-school tutoring program, maybe with an outside vendor that has actually good pre- and post-test data. It seems like they're making a difference. But it's totally disconnected to what's happening in the classroom. So this student, we did, gave them a pre-test. It said they need help with fractions. So we're working on fractions. Our post-test showed they learned fractions. We all feel good. But you know what? The kid's test on Friday was on probability, and he failed that test. Because no one was working on probability, we were off working on a fraction. So we really have to make sure those tutoring efforts are tightly linked to what's going on in the students' courses. And then we need to think about effective second chance and recovery options, which hold students accountable. Absolutely. You've got to do the work. There's no free pass. But provides a reason for them to keep trying. If they get the message that by the first quarter, I'm so far behind, there's nothing I can do to recover, and that's a signal to me to start taking some days off, right? And, and I'll come around and do it again a second time, which is the exact wrong message we want to send. We want to say, no, if you, if, you knuckle, if you settle down and try harder and we give you some help, you can still find a way to make it. So we have to really think through how to do that in a fair and effective way um, that works for everyone. And that's often a tough conversation to have with a faculty, but it's an important one because essentially we want to have kids to have a second chance, but we want that to involve putting forth effort and tr with support, not just sort of getting a free pass. So we're almost there to our final question. So just a few key summing up things, um, what we've learned from our early adopters in the field. It really takes a team with time and facilitation. Individual teachers can't do this alone. We really have to have a team approach and some support for that team, especially in the beginning, to help them get used to this, this method, this methodology, this approach. We also need to get easy access to timely, actionable data. School time is the most precious thing, and it needs to be used for analysis and action, not assembling the data, right? We need this idea of multi-tier intervention systems, prevention, targeted, uh, small group, in a way this is supercharged RTI, response to intervention, for folks that are doing that and know that, but it's sort of for everyone, right? It's, it's, it's sort of generalized across attendance, behavior, course performance, um, and for all students in the school, not just for certain areas and certain subsets of students. And at the end of the day, that very first thing we started with, you know, it's the cognitive challenge of the coursework they face and the relationships with adults. We need to integrate this back with instruction. And that really ha happens by looking at it, not just individual interventions, but at classroom and at school level and thinking, what can we do at the classroom and school level to prevent the kind of outcomes we're getting and not so we have to do individual interventions for everyone. Um, the good news is we know why students drop out. We know where they drop out from and the warning signs. We have effective interventions and examples of substantial improvement. So this really is a giant engineering challenge. You're getting the right supports, the right students, the right time at the 
scale and intensity required, and America is good at engineering challenges. So for more information, you can visit our website or shoot us an email, or the, also the Meadow Center and the Middle Grades Matter website has got, as you know, tons of great links and resources as well.